Good evening. Good to see everybody here tonight. If you're joining us online for the first time, I'm Pastor DJ. Thank you for being part of our service. We're going to stand for a word of prayer, sing a hymn together, or welcome him together. And uh, right now we're going to ask God's blessing on our service. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, it's good to be uh, with brothers and sisters in Christ. We ask God, your spirit, to have free reign tonight uh, in, uh, uh, God, uh, this room and with the youth and with the kids' choir, God. Uh, that you do a work tonight in us and among us. And uh, God, use your word here tonight to uh, give us light on the future and on how we need to live in the present. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, sing this hymn with me. We have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Spread the tidings all around. Jesus saves, bear the news to every land, climb the steeps and cross the waves, onward tis our Lord's command, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, sing above the battle strife, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, by his death and endless life, Jesus saves. Sing it softly through the gloom When the heart for mercy craves Sing it triumph for the tomb Jesus saves, Jesus saves Alright, turn and find somebody you didn't see this morning Welcome them to church number of uh, announcements and prayer requests, uh, but want to start with a praise that we didn't uh, mention this morning. Uh, we did receive news that uh, nine were saved Thursday night at the Union Rescue Mission. So once again, the Lord is still in the saving business. A uh, number of announcements, uh, youth and kids choir are uh, on Sunday evenings during the evening service. We're also having youth on Wednesday nights during prayer meeting and Bible study. Also on Wednesdays, our weight loss group meets at 9.30 a.m., and it's never too late to join. Uh, right now, we're collecting items for the homeless through the end of July. There will be a designated box in the foyer. Uh, items can be lightly worn socks, tents, backpacks, blankets, and related items. We'll be collecting these for the mission through the end of July. Please see Jana Hook or Paul Nightingale if you have any questions. Um, next Sunday is our Family Sunday. No Sunday morning Bible study, children's church, or nursery in the morning. We'll be having a movie night next Sunday evening for the whole family. Uh, the church will be providing popcorn and drinks, and you can bring it your own chair if you would like. Also, uh, the week of August 1st through the 6th, there will be a uh, ceiling and a relining in our parking lot, uh, so there won't be any vehicles allowed in. So that is Monday, August 1st through Saturday the 6th. Uh, prayer requests. I continue to pray for Kenny Largent. Uh, he's improving but still in the hospital in need of our prayers. Uh, Bob and Carlene McCalla. Uh, Bob is home and doing better. Uh, Dave Twig uh, hurt his back. Uh, Faye Fisher, kidney issues. Uh, Bill and Don Wilgus, Peggy Williams. Uh, Linda Olinger, kidney problems. And many others who are sick who've lost loved ones, others that are not listed here. And we, once again, need to pray for our country. So if you bow with me, let's open in a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you, Lord, that we are able to be out in your house again this evening. We thank you for this Lord's Day. Uh, Father, we thank you that you're a God who answers prayer, Lord, for we are certainly a needy people. 
Uh, Father, we've mentioned many on this list that need physical healing. Uh, but, Father, once again, uh, there's many that uh, are in need of spiritual healing. Uh, Father, it is a blessing to hear those that were saved this week. And, Lord, even tonight, through this message, those that are here or watching online, we just pray that the Holy Spirit will work in their hearts. And, Lord, that tonight would be a night of salvation. Uh, Father, we do pray for our nation. Uh, Lord, once again, we pray that we would turn our face back to you. And Father, tonight, uh, Lord, may we be in a mindset of worship. May the Holy Spirit have free reign tonight. We love you. We praise you. We ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. Praise the Lord. You can remain seated tonight. We're going to teach you a new song. One of the hardest things we have to do as musicians sometimes is when you take one of these modern worship songs that are like 20 minutes long and shorten it to the point where we can actually not take up the whole Sunday night service with one song. So, I did my best on this song. I do encourage you to listen to the full version. It's very inspiring. And uh, I, I just love it. I love the words to this song. Where was the darkness when hope was restored? Where was the spare when my God split the shore? Where was the feet? Lord took a breath when he stood in fire by the grave that he left. Nowhere, nowhere, nowhere is it fear when my king resurrects. Nowhere, nowhere, nowhere was the doubt when my king conquered death. When dry bones arose And where was the pain When the sick touched the road And where was the stress When my king laid the rest The stronghold of sin By the grace that he possessed Come. 
Father God, we just thank you. Thank you for love that we cannot even begin to fathom. You are so good. 
Lord Jesus, we love you from the bottom of our hearts. We cannot begin to thank you enough for all that you that you do for us every single day. Not just what you've done, but what you continue to do daily. Father, help us remember who we are. That we are children of the Most High. That we don't have to walk around defeated. That we don't have to walk around with our heads down and oh, woe is me. Jesus Christ is my Lord and my King. God is my Father, the Lord of all creation holds me in the palm of his hand. And nothing in this world, nothing under this world, nothing in all creation can change that. I belong to God. Help us remember that every day. We do not have to be defeated. Because you are our daddy. Father God, I just thank you for this evening. I thank you for this wonderful moment. And I pray right now that your blessing and your anointing will be on DJ as he brings forth your word. I pray that it will take root in our hearts and grow into something incredible that we can take outside the four walls of this church and use for your kingdom. We give this night to you and we thank you for the gift that it is. Lord. In Jesus' name. Turn with me to Daniel chapter 12. Shall we gather at the river one more time in the book of Daniel here, the river of dreams? Not the river of dreams that Billy Joel sang about, but the uh, river that Daniel dreamed about here in this final great vision of his book and of his life in Daniel chapter 12. We have come a long way together. Lord willing, we'll have a long way to go as we move past Daniel's visions into visions and dreams and into specific teachings that Jesus gave because as, as the Bible tells us, Moses and Jesus, God didn't, the Father didn't speak to them in visions and dreams. He spoke directly to them. All the other prophets received visions and dreams to, to some degree, even the apostles. But we're going to be looking at other visions and dreams from others as we go forward and we'll be uh, Lord willing, next month, looking at the Olivet Discourse, the teachings of Jesus himself. And Jesus is going to build on what we have learned in Daniel, what he revealed to us through Daniel. And we're going to see even more about the end times than Daniel was able, able to understand. Uh, but tonight, uh, we may be able to finish these last few verses. If not, we'll pick it up again uh, at the beginning of next month. Next week, we'll have our uh, family Sunday time. We'll, uh, we won't be uh, here. We'll be over in the fellowship uh, hall together. I hope you will be here for that. Just uh, next week, a time of fellowship as we uh, watch a movie and, and just have some uh, family time uh, together. Uh, and then in August, uh, Lord willing, we'll begin to answer some of the questions. We will hopefully touch on answers to some of your questions uh, tonight. Uh, but we'll look specifically at some questions that uh, have been sent to me um, or uh, given to me over the past number of months. If you have a question about Daniel or about prophecy, about something that we've covered over the past year and, you, and you're still just confused and you'd like a little more clarification, uh, feel free. You can hand it to me. You can write it down and hand it to me. Uh, but the best thing to do would be to email it to me. So either through Facebook or through my uh, personal email, Pastor DJ Richie at gmail.com. And uh, that way it's in writings. That way if I, don't, if I uh, put it in my Bible, it doesn't fall out, I don't lose it. Uh, if it's in uh, email or, or messenger so, uh, or text, you can, you can text me as well. Uh, if you have a question, it's still time to get those in. Uh, but tonight I think we're going to begin to answer some questions as we look at two questions. Two questions that are given to us at the end. We're not necessarily going to be content with the way God answered those questions. But again, some of the answers are going to come in the weeks ahead. Now let's look uh, here again before we dive into the last half of this chapter. Let's just for context pick it up in verse 1 and read through verse 4. And at that time, speaking of the time of the end... Shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, speaking of Israel, 
even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. This was not A.D. 70. This was not World War II. This is something that makes uh, both of those look like the nation of Israel fell down and skinned their knee. Th this is going to be a time unlike any in, in human history. Uh, and it will be a time uh, not just of judgment as the flood of Noah was, but a time of purification. And all Israel who is truly saved will be saved in that day. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they shall turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Now in these few verses, we see the culmination of a time the Bible calls the time of Jacob's trouble, when the only thing that will keep the nation of Israel from being completely destroyed is the intervention of the archangel Michael himself, leader of the army of heaven, who will uh, lead the battle, uh, the war in heaven that is yet to come, Revelation chapter 12. He will be commissioned to protect and preserve what remains of Israel for the final three and a half years of human history prior to the second coming. And then we know we have the hope of Israel's deliverance. Again, verse 1, Zechariah 12 talks about that. We spent a time uh, about a year ago now in Romans 9 through 11 looking at God's promises to Israel. Those promises were not moved to the church. Those promises remain with Israel. Israel is not the church. The church is not Israel. We are a mystery. We are something that was hidden in the Old Covenant. We are something that was hidden until Jesus came and died and rose again, until the Spirit came and gave birth to the church, and until the Apostle Paul was sent to explain the church. Jesus promised to build his church. It was the Apostle Paul who explained what that was all about. And so there was no church. So we are not the church. We have not inherited the promises of Israel. We are in Christ. We get the blessings of Israel by being in Christ, not by being Israel. And so those blessings are blessings that will fall on us because we are in the King of Kings, the King of Israel, Jesus Christ. But Israel will be delivered. Those promises are for Israel and they will be fulfilled. We talked about the resurrections of life and death. We saw from Revelation 20 that those resurrections are separated by uh, over a thousand years. The millennial kingdom. The resurrection of the righteous at the end of the tribulation. The resurrection of the wicked at the end of time when God sets up the great white throne judgment and we exit this heaven and earth and we enter the new heaven and the new earth where time will not have the same meaning that it has now. We will enter into the eternal state and we'll live with the Lord forever and ever. We talked about the glorification of the saints and we spent uh, time in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and talked about what that's going to look like. And then last week in verse 4 we talked about the sealing of the book. Just uh, That's the S-E-A-L, not the sealing of the book, but the closing of the book, the sealing of the book. The angel commanded, commanded Daniel to shut up the words and to seal the book. We, we assume this is an angel. We believe it's an angel. I disagree with those, strongly disagree with those who believe this is um, a pre-incarnate uh, manifestation of Jesus Christ. I, I think there's a lot of contradiction to that position. But I think there's a strong support that this is an angel and not just a prophet. But uh, we don't know that dogmatically because the text does not say that here. But it, it appears to be... Uh, the angel that is speaking to Daniel back at the beginning of this vision. And so I think we can, with pretty strong certainty, say that this is that angel, uh, this man clothed in linen, which stood upon the waters of the river. Uh, and then this book is to remain shut and sealed even to the time of the end. Now, hear me say this because it's going to become important in a few minutes. The time of the end, according to this angel, according to this man in, in white is not the second coming because the book is going to be opened and unsealed before that. That's going to be important that we understand that in context, the end is not the...
the second coming. We saw um, a few weeks ago in uh, Revelation chapter 10, the seven thunder judgments. It will be then in the midst of the tribulation, not the end of the tribulation, when all the mysteries of God will be unsealed and, and will be understood. So the time of the end is going to actually be closer to the middle of the tribulation than the end of the tribulation. That's, that's how he is using this term. And it's important when you study scripture that you understand context and you understand how the speaker is using a word, how the speaker is using a term, and that we don't try to impress our own meanings on the words of scripture. Uh, the devil is in the dictionary and it's important that we kick him out of the dictionary, especially when we're dealing with God's word and with Bible words. Don't let the devil change the words, the meaning of the words that God has used. So the book will remain shut until they are revealed, which will occur during the tribulation. There are two signs that will precede the book's unsealing. We gave you uh, the, the common view, the, the general view, which is that when he says um, that many will run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. Many people say, well, that, that means that there's going to be a widespread travel and, and, and general knowledge will increase. And um, there are some good commentaries who hold that position, but the better interpretation in context is that many shall run to and fro and knowledge of this prophecy shall increase. Now, why are many running to and fro? We're going to see why in just a few minutes. But the, these signs will precede the unsealing. Actually, I'll tell you what, let's just go there now. To keep a finger in, in Daniel chapter 2 and go over a few books with me uh, to the right. Hosea, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos. Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Amos chapter 8. I know this is hard for us to understand, but God's prophecies never fail. So this will happen. This will happen. Amos chapter 8. Verse 11, back up to verse 10. I will turn your feasts into mourning, all your songs into lamentations. And I will bring up sackcloth upon all loins and baldness upon every head. And I will make it as the morning of an only son and the end thereof is a bitter day. This is what awaits those who do not know Jesus Christ. They may have a form of godliness, but they deny the power of it. And they will be left behind because they do not have a personal savior. They don't know Jesus as their Savior. They may know Him as a historical figure. They may know Him as a religious figure. But there's never been a time in their life when they have called upon Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins, where they acknowledge that they are a sinner before a holy, righteous God, but that God's Son came to earth, lived a sinless life, died on the cross to pay for their sin in their place, rose again victorious, and offers them forgiveness. They've never called upon Him for forgiveness. They know Him as a religious figure as a historical figure not as a personal savior and they will be left behind behold the day comes verse 11 saith the lord and i will send a famine in the land not a famine of bread nor a thirst for water that's coming to revelation 6 but that's not the famine he's talking about here not a famine of bread nor a thirst of water but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. So, I don't know how many Bibles you have in your house. I have quite a few. I have quite a few Bibles in my office. I have stacks of Bibles. I have more Bibles than I know, I know what to do with. I have King James, New King James, I have ESV, I have other translations that I use for research purposes, and, and uh, I think there is some value, especially as you get into the Old Testament, on some of the other translations. Uh, I believe that the received text is the most reliable manuscripts for the New Testament. That's all I'm going to get into about that. But I have many, many Bibles it's hard to imagine a time in the future when people won't be able to find a Bible. It's hard to imagine. But what, what's happened? What's happened? Many people today, they don't carry their Bible to church with them in their hand. They carry it on their phone. 
they become more and more... Now, I use online Bibles, too, for study. For the, I use an interlinear Bible online, BibleHub.com. I use the interlinear almost every week, if not every week. I use BibleGateway.com. I use several online Bible resources, not as a replacement for the physical Word of God, but as a, as a help, as a, as a study resource. Sometimes it's a lot easier for me to type in that, that verse than to thumb through the Bible to find it. Here's the problem with online. They can change it like that. They can change it like that. They can change books that you have that you bought. They can remove them. You bought it, for, you bought it through Amazon for your Kindle. They can remove that book. You say, I paid for it. doesn't matter. They can pull it off your phone. They can pull it off your computer. And they have technology that you... You better, if you're going to use it on a flash drive, your computer better be disconnected from the internet when you plug that flash drive in. The days are coming when people will not be able to find the Word of God. Today it is so plenteous. So today you can, you can trip over Bibles in some of our homes. We have so many of them. But the day is coming when people will have to run to and fro. See, that's what Daniel 12 is telling us. In the future, people are going to be running around trying to find, trying to find the book of Daniel. So that they can study it. You, you think book burning was bad during the Nazi regime. Well, people are going to be burning Bibles again. In this country and in every country when the Antichrist comes to power. He's not going to want you to read a Bible if you're left behind. He's going to do everything he can. One, one of the most profound exhibits down at the uh, Bible Museum. I don't know how many of you have been to the Bible Museum in Washington, D.C. It's a... A tremendous uh, place to go. I'd encourage you to go. Uh, there was a couple rooms and a couple exhibits that really had a profound impact on me. Uh, the, the biggest one was when you go in at, at the end of the, of the tour, when you go into the room where they show you all the languages where they don't, they don't have a Bible yet. A and just the, the weight of that, the weight of that hit me. And I, I wanted to cry. I was with the students at CC. I was a teacher at the time, and I didn't want to see all the students see me cry, so I'm trying not to cry in front of anybody. But I thought, how much we have taken for granted this book in our own language that we, we don't need, you don't need to come to church to hear somebody share it with you. All you need to know is how to read. And you can be studying this all the time. You can be reading the very words of God. The very words of God. And there are many, many people groups who don't, who don't have that yet. They don't have that yet. Many in the end times will be running to and fro to try to find a Bible. But here's the promise. Knowledge is going to increase anyways. The Spirit is going to be moving among those who are truly saved. We'll have the two witnesses, which we'll talk about again in just a few moments, who will be going around. We'll have the 144,000 evangelists who are sealed and won't be able to be killed during their uh, missionary time on earth. And they're going to be um, spreading the word of God as well until their mission has been accomplished. And God is going to do a work to make sure even in the tribulation that people are being saved. And so these things will precede the time of the end. And these things we start to see even now. The machinations, the framework being set up. In Canada, you can't... It, it, in Canada, in Canada, where I have family in Canada. My wife is Canadian Ameri uh, U.S. Canadian citizen. In Canada, you can't preach from Romans chapter 1 about homosexuality and not fear appraisal, uh, reprisal from the government for hate speech. That's coming here. That's coming here as well. So uh, have a plan in place for when Pastor DJ gets taken out in handcuffs because he preached the Bible. And just have a plan in place. I pray that it doesn't come to that. But you better make your choice now before it gets there what you're going to do and who you're going to be. So let's talk now about the time of the end in verses 5 and following. And let's look at these closing two questions in this book. Verse 5, Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood other two, the one on this side of the bank of the river, the other on the other side of the bank of the river. One said 
to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever, that it shall be for a time, times and half a time, and when he shall have accomplished, when he shall have accomplished. Now who is he swearing to here? The one who shall live forever. When he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. The scene here shifts back to the river of dreams at the Tigris. And we see Daniel and we believe this angelic messenger with two men. And I said last week, I I don't believe these are angels. They certainly could be, but the text does not say they are angels. So we can't assume they are. I personally believe that these are the two witnesses of Revelation. I think these are two prophets coming from two different time periods brought on opposite sides of the river to see this vision. The fact that they don't understand the vision and they're asking an angel about the vision would indicate to me they're not angels. It would would be an argument to say these aren't actually angels. But these are, I believe, the two witnesses of, of Revelation Uh, I believe, uh, as the early church did, Enoch and Elijah. I think we can debate whether it's Enoch or Moses or another prophet, but uh, I believe Elijah is a biblical view, given Malachi chapter 4, that Elijah will return. Given what we saw again last week, Jesus himself said, coming down the Mount of Transfiguration, Elijah is coming, Jesus said. He has come in John the Baptist, but Elijah is still coming. He is coming back to accomplish the mission I sent him to accomplish. And so regardless of who these witnesses are, I believe that they're the two witnesses of Revelation. But the first question was asked by one of them. How long shall it be to the end of these wonders? How long shall it be to the end of these wonders? Now, again, we've already established in this text that the end is not the second coming, does not need to be the second coming. That the end is not... Uh, the day of the second coming, but the time or the season of the second coming. The end is when that season occurs. And when will that season begin? Well, the context here is Israel's hope. Israel's hope. Not the end of the world. Not the end of time. But the end of Israel's purification process. The end of Israel's deliverance remember back in chapter 10 we're told that this is what this prophecy is all about this prophecy is about what shall befall thy people Daniel is told this is the Israelites in the latter days chapter 12 verse 1 this is about the ultimate deliverance of Israel and yes it touches briefly on events that will happen after that including the resurrection of the wicked which we know from Revelation 20 isn't going to happen for a thousand years after this But this event concerns Israel, the end of Israel's time of trouble. That's that's what's in focus here. This is an Israel-centric prophecy. And so these wonders, quote, these wonders, chiefly concern the history and prophecy of Israel. Additionally, uh, as I've already said, the fact that these angels don't know that, or that these, these witnesses don't know that, is, is, in, is suggestive that they're not angels, that they are uh, prophets themselves. Uh, if not the two witnesses, then certainly prophets. I don't know why there would be two other prophets that are unnamed there, other than the two witnesses who, I don't know why other prophets would need to know what the two witnesses would need to know. Now notice this vow here. I think there's some significance and symbolism in the way that the angel vows. He's on the waters. He's raises both hands not just one hand but both hands and he swears to him that liveth forever and ever now why why two hands well it is stressing on one hand the certainty of, it, it's like a it's like when you say verily verily or amen and amen it is an emphasis of the certainty and the seriousness of these prophecies that is certainly one reason he's saying hey this is not just a vow this is a double vow these things will happen And they will happen exactly as God said. But I think as you look at prophecy in particular, there is another significance to the raising of the two hands. 
There are a couple of other times in prophecy, we're not going to look at, at, at every instance, but there are a couple of other times in prophecy when the left hand and the right hand are mentioned in regards to prophecy. In Isaiah, for example, both uh, judgment and blessing, the extent, the certainty, and the magnitude of the both judgment and the blessing are expressed as on both the right hand and the left, or both the left hand and the right, you will see judgment. On both the right hand and the left, you will see God's blessing. As far as you can go in either direction is what it's saying. You will see God's blessing. But there's another prophecy uh, where significantly, where there are actually two witnesses mentioned that the right hand and the left hand are both indicated. And that is the prophecy of Zechariah chapter 4. Now, we're not going to take the time to turn to Zechariah chapter 4. I always encourage you, don't take my word for anything. Go to the book uh, on your own time tonight, uh, before you go to bed or tomorrow morning, whenever you do your devos, and read Zechariah chapter 4 for yourself. But Zechariah has this amazing vi vision. This is where we see, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. And he has this vision of the golden lampstand, and on either side of the golden lampstand, he sees two olive trees. Zechariah, we find that the, that the um, lampstand symbolizes the Holy Spirit and the work of the Holy Spirit. But Zechariah says, what are these two olive trees on the right hand and on the left hand? And God says to Zechariah, these are my two anointed witnesses who will stand before the whole earth. Now, isn't it significant that we see in Zechariah... Two witnesses, one on the right hand, one on the left, who are the two anointed witnesses, we're told. And then we go fast forward to Revelation chapter 11, where two witnesses are talked about, and God says they are two olive trees. They're two olive trees. I think this is another indication, hinted, we can't be dogmatic, but hinted in the Scripture that these are the two witnesses of Revelation here. By his right hand and his left hand, we see that same symbolism used in Zechariah chapter 12, speaking of the two olive trees who are the two witnesses, as revealed again in Revelation chapter 11. So in Daniel 12, we have the certainty of this prophecy. We have the magnitude of both the judgment and blessing. And then we also have a correlation, the left hand and the right hand, to the two witnesses, and lo and behold, what do we see here? Two witnesses standing with Daniel at the river. Now let's talk about this answer from the angel a moment. The, answer, the angel doesn't just swear, but he says that the end will be, he says, when will the end of these wonders be? And he says it shall be for a time, times, and a half, and when he shall have accomplished, he being the one he is swearing to, God, to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. Now, every commentary that I looked at over the last two weeks, except for one, well, two of them, one of them was a Reformed commentary. That, that one wasn't much help at all, okay? It was way off on this, on this text. But all the other ones, uh, except for one, said this is an indication of the last three and a half years. The last three and a half years. The second half of the tribulation. Keep, keep your finger in Daniel 12 and turn back with me just a few pages to Daniel uh, chapter 7 for a moment. Daniel chapter 7. I want to show you uh, some verses in Daniel 7 and then again in Daniel 9. Daniel 7 verse 23, he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces, and the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and others shall arise after them, after them, or out of them as well. He shall be diverse from the first, he shall subdue three kings, and he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until the time and times and the dividing of time. But the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it unto the end. Now, look at Daniel chapter 9 with me. Daniel chapter 9, the forbidden chapter in Daniel, which the rabbis tell the Jews, don't read this, you won't be able to understand it. They're afraid they'll understand it, that's why they tell them that. 
Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon the holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of the sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. These are 70 weeks dealing with not the Gentiles, but with the nation of Israel. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. Sixty-nine weeks of this prophecy. Sixty-nine sevens. That's sixty-nine times seven years. From the sending out to the going, the, to the sending of, to the call to rebuild, until Messiah presents himself to Israel and is crucified. Israel had the exact day on the calendar when Jesus would come into Jerusalem and present himself as Messiah. And as evidence that he was the true Messiah, Daniel says, the temple will be destroyed. And pay close attention to what, na what nation destroys the temple because that will be the people of the prince to come. And what's going to happen with the prince to come? Verse 27, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So there is going to occur an event that will start the final seven years of Israel's history before the second coming. And that event is not the rapture. That event is the signing of the covenant with the Antichrist. The rapture will take place before that. We don't know exactly how long. We have some theories about how long. There is some debate about that. But once the restrainer is gone, it, it, he steps aside and he removes his restraining influence, the church, the gathering of the church, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the mystery of lawlessness will be unleashed on the world. And one of the first things that he does after he gains power will be to make a seven-year covenant with Israel. That will start the clock. Right now, right now, we're in timeout. Right now, the clock is not running. We are in timeout. We're in timeout. But when that treaty and that covenant gets signed, the clock is ticking. And for three and a half years, Israel is going to be sitting pretty. Israel is going to be at peace. The whole world around Israel is going to be in chaos. But Israel will be fine because the Antichrist is protecting Israel. He has a covenant with them. But then at the midpoint, he marches into the temple. He sets up the abomination of desolation in the temple of God, which will be rebuilt. Which will be rebuilt. And he breaks his covenant. And in that moment, Matthew 24 tells us, we're going to look at this more in depth in a few weeks, Lord willing, when we go to Matthew 24 and look at the all of the discourse. God, God will use the Antichrist to judge his people. He will scatter them. The scattering does not occur at the end. The scattering of the power of Israel does not occur at the end of the tribulation. The scattering of the power of Israel occurs at the midpoint when the abomination of desolation is set up. And then we are in the end. We are in the end. Now the end is three and a half years long. But we've already established that the end is not the final day. It is the final time. It's the final season. It's the final inning. Or the final two minute warning. It's the end period. It's not the end moment. And so I agree with the lone commentator who says this is not speaking of the second half of the seven years. It is speaking of the first half when Israel will be sitting pretty. But see, at that midpoint when the Antichrist betrays Israel and God uses him to scatter the people, in Matthew 24, Jesus says, you better run. You better run. 
And how are they going to survive Michael the Archangel? Chapter 12, verse 1. How are they going to endure for three and a half years? Michael the Archangel. Michael the Archangel. God's anointed angel to protect them and to get them through that season. And so I believe what we're seeing here is the time leading up to the end here. Matthew 24, 15 through 22. This is when the power of Israel will be shattered and scattered and Israel will be on the run for three and a half years. That's when we're in the time of the end. Now, if you understand that and you agree with that, then Daniel's question is going to make a lot more sense. If you take the view that the angel is saying in answer to the first question, well, it's the final three and a half years of of human history, then Daniel's question doesn't make much sense. Daniel's question doesn't make much sense. We, we, we did a little review of Daniel, Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 9, did a, did a review a few weeks ago, we, tonight we looked at Daniel 7 and Daniel 9, Daniel had a lot of information about how the end was going to play out, he knew about the abomination of desolation, that was not news to him, he'd known that for years, but what he didn't know what was going to happen after, how God, how do we get from the abomination of desolation to Israel being delivered? How do we get from Israel being scattered to Israel being delivered? How do we get there, God? That's the question. And so the second question we see asked by Daniel, what shall be the end of these things? What shall be the end? How do we get from point A to point B, God? I, I already know about the abomination of desolation. What happens next? How do we get from there to the deliverance? And if you understand that the first answer deals with the first half of the tribulation then Daniel's question about the second half of the tribulation makes a lot more sense verse 8 I heard but I understood not and some of you say amen I understood not hey hang with it okay hang with it it is worth your study it's worth your meditation Daniel had trouble too don't give up I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? How are we going to get there from here? Verse 9, he said, this is the answer we don't want. Uh, Go thy way, Daniel. For the words are closed up and sealed to the time of the end. Now here's what I can tell you, Daniel, about the last three and a half years. Here's what I can tell you. Many shall be purified and made white and tried but the wicked shall do wickedly and none of the wicked shall understand but the wise shall understand and from the time here Daniel you want to know what happens after the abomination of desolation here we go and from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that maketh desolate set up there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. But go thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of days. Now here's the answer. You got to go. Your prophecy's done. I'm not going to reveal the last three and a half years through you, Daniel. You're not the one who's going to get those prophecies. But I will give you some clarification on five things. And let's walk through these five as we close. As we close tonight, as we close this book. Number one, many, specifically Israel, that's the context here. That's the context. Many, after the abomination is set up, the Antichrist has betrayed Israel. And Israel is on the run. And only Michael the archangel himself is is, uh, the one protecting them from total annihilation by God's divine ordinance. Number one, Daniel, know this. What's going to happen during that time? God's going to get some people purified. Many will be tried and purified during the time of the end. When Israel gets to the end, all that will be left of Israel are the true, true believers. And Zechariah says, they will look on him whom they pierced. Jesus said, I ain't coming back to you. Call for me. Well, they are one as one voice in Israel going to call on the Lord 
and he will answer them and he will come back and we get to come with him revelation 19 and we will be riding the white horses and all the king's horses and all the king's men going to watch the king put things back together again amen so that's going to be a time of purification but here's the other thing that daniel's going to say to that daniel says to us because of what the angel says to daniel many others will remain in their wickedness and their spiritual blindness. This is when the great delusion comes. Not, in the, not after the rapture. I know that that's, what, that's the common view that's taught. If you don't receive Jesus now, when the rapture comes, you won't be able to believe. No, 2 Thessalonians doesn't teach that. After the Antichrist declares himself to be God, that's when the great delusion comes. You will have had, after the rapture, until the time of the Antichrist rise, and then you have three and a half years. You have three and a half years. But if you had your chance and you rejected, God says, that's who you believe is God? That's who you want for your God? You got him. I'm going to send a great delusion, and you won't be able to believe. And so that's why Revelation says this. Marty, you asked me this question a, a, a while ago, and I hadn't gotten back to you yet. So here's the answer to your question. Marty gets his question answer, a, answered first because he asked a long time ago, okay? Here's how the Bible ends. Here's how the Bible ends. Revelation chapter 22. Let me pick it up in verse 11. Let me pick it up in verse 10. He says, Unto me, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly. My reward is with me to give every man according to his work as his work shall be. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I believe this is a prophecy for those living in the last three and a half years. When it's all set, the delusion's coming. And when that delusion comes, as Daniel prophesies, as Paul prophesies, your choice is locked in. Is that your final answer? Yes, final answer, locked in. And if you choose injustice and filthiness, that's your choice. Let you be filthy still. And for those who choose to trust in the Lord, your answer gets locked in too. Now hopefully that's not you. Hopefully that's not you. Hopefully you're with me up there. But for those who are left behind, maybe somebody stumbling upon this message online somehow in the end times by the work of the Holy Spirit or some other uh, a preacher's message uh, by the Holy Spirit giving you this, um, this teaching in those days. Um, let him that be holy be holy still there's a time coming when everything gets locked in number three back in Daniel chapter 12 at that time only the pure and the wise will understand these prophecies only the pure and the wise you're going to have to get you're going to have to get your heart right with God to understand these prophecies number one they're going to be hard to find they're going to be edited I, I, I started to tell you um a few minutes ago um, about the, the, the uh, exhibits in the uh, Bible Museum that really struck me. I told you about one of them. Here's the other one. When we went into the, to, to the room where they were back in early America, and you see the early American Bibles, and there was a stand there where they had a slave's Bible. They didn't let the slaves have the whole Bible. They edited the Bibles that they would give to the slaves. They give them a Bible. Oh, we want you to be religious. But we don't want you to have the whole Bible. You might get some ideas about freedom, and about equality. And you might get some ideas about everybody being made in the image of God. We don't want you to have the whole Bible. They edited the Bible. And that's what's going to happen in the end days. It's, it's happening now. It's happening now. Words getting changed and things getting moved around. It's happening now. But it's going to be even worse in the end times. And so there won't be the opportunity that people have. But even those who hear it, even those who, who receive it, if they don't trust in Jesus, if they want to trust in the Antichrist, it's going to be written right out for them and they're still not going to get it. Here's your sign, God says. Here's your sign. 
you make your choice, you're going to live with your choice. Number four, let me give you two more before we close. Look again here at these two time periods. Verse 11, at the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that make it desolate set up, there shall be 1,290 days. By the way, that's uh, three and a half years plus. And then we have, blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the 1,305 and 30 days. Now we got more time added. So what is going on here? When the abomination of desolation sets up, there are exactly 1,260 days left until the second coming. Now that's a promise. People will be able to bank on that. People will set their clocks if they are wise. If they're one of the wise, they'll set their clocks. 1,260 days. But notice there are two time periods that follow the second coming. This is the beginning, uh, Amber, to answer one of your questions. We'll get a little more into it when we get farther in. But what happens after the second coming? Well, here's what happens immediately after the second coming. There's a period of 30 days. And there's another period of 40 dot, 45 days before the start of the millennium. Now, why do we need time periods? Why do we need extra time after the second coming before the start of the millennial kingdom? Well, friend, you read the book of Revelation, you're going to see hell on earth literally unleash. There's going to be a lot of work to do. And by the way, we're going to be doing it when we come back with Jesus. We're going to work. And we're going to be setting up the new governments. And we're going to be setting up the world kingdoms. Jesus said, blessed are the meek. They shall inherit the earth. Now when we get it, it's going to be a mess. But by God's grace, we're going to be fixing things up. We're going to be making the mountains beautiful again. And we're going to be making the water clean again. And we're going to be building places for people to live again. And we're going to be setting up you say, well, where's that in the Bible? Well, one place is uh, back in uh, Daniel uh, chapter, let me get the right chapter here. Uh, I can't find where I have it written down. But if you go back a few chapters, I think it's Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 through 10, where he talks about the thrones that will be set up. The thrones, plural, that we will, that we will sit on, that we will be judging. We will be, a, we will be part of the new kingdom structure and oversight and there's a whole world to rebuild and there's going to take some time to set up the new governments because all of the old leaders are going to be rotting on in Armageddon Valley they're going to be they're going to be taken out the wicked rulers are going to be all gone and so those who there's going to be the time that there's going to need to be a time period of, of judgment the, the judgment of the sheep and the goats that we'll talk about in a, in a, a month or two in, in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus talks about. There's going to have to be time. We're told that, that God at the end is going to gather all nations. Everybody on the planet is going to have to come to Jerusalem. Everybody who's still alive. Everybody hiding up in Alaska. And everybody hiding somewhere out in the Sahara. And everybody hiding anywhere on the planet is going to have to be all gathered together. And that's going to take some time. So the second coming, that's on the clock. Now we have a time period to gather the nations. Now we have a judgment. And not everybody's coming through that judgment with a happy face. We'll talk more about that in a few weeks when we get to Matthew 25, the, the judgment of the sheep and the goats. Some people are going to come into the kingdom and many will be sent into outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Oh, they made it through the tribulation alive but they didn't make it alive by knowing Jesus they didn't make it alive by faith and so they're not going to be part of the kingdom there will be a, a time of cleansing there will be time for rewards various judgment the temple will need to be cleansed and so we have these two time periods that are set up to allow for that to happen and if you make it through all of that Daniel tells those living in the last days, those who miss the rapture, who get saved after the rapture, who live through the tribulation, who make it by faith in God. They're the holy ones who God has set apart because of their faith in Jesus. And they make it through the end and they resist it until the end. He who endures to the end will be saved. And they stand at that judgment and they are not goats, they are sheep and they enter into the kingdom. And the angel says, blessed is he 
that walketh and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. And you make it through the judgment and you make it through the restructuring and you get to enter into the utopia. Can you imagine a world without crime where crime is dealt with swiftly and severely and you don't have to live in fear of it? A world without funerals every day? Oh, people, the wicked will still die. But death will be a rare thing in the kingdom. You don't have to worry about snakes. Your kids will be able to play with, with, with vipers and they'll be friendly and you won't have to worry. We went to the we took Elijah to the zoo the other week, a, a, week, a week ago or so. Um, saw the snakes in, in Pittsburgh, the, the poisonous snakes. You won't have to be afraid of those. It'll be, a, it'll be complete, no sickness. You won't need hospitals everywhere. You won't need clinics there. We had Elijah at the clinic today. He has an ear infection. He's doing better. Pray for him that he heals completely quickly. We had a, a, an interesting afternoon, but you won't, have that, you won't have to worry about those things in the kingdom. You won't have to worry about those things those things in the kingdom. Now, here's the last thing as we close tonight. We're not going to uh, take time uh, for an invitation, but I, I will tell you that I'll be here after the service. If you need to talk, I'll be available. If you have a decision, you need someone to pray with, uh, I and the other deacons will still be here and be available. Let me just keep you a few more minutes for this last thing. I will try as best I can with God's word and the authority that we have to answer the questions that you have. But I can never, ever promise to answer all your questions don't have all my questions answered and here's how the book ends verse 13 but go thou thy way till the end be for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days Daniel I'm not answering all your questions today God has not chosen to answer all your questions today we got a lot more answers than Daniel had but we don't have them all but here's the promise, Daniel. There's a day coming when all your questions will be answered forever. And I know some of you have a lot of questions. You're going through a hard time. You've been through it. You've got a lot of questions. There's a day coming when all the answers you ever need will be provided. And you will stand in your lot at the end of days. So I ask you this as we close. Daniel's mission was over. His mission was fulfilled. His hope was secure. Where are you at? Is your hope secure in the Lord? Do you have the same hope that Daniel had, that Daniel has today in eternity? Daniel's mission was fulfilled. I, I'm assuming if you're still here breathing, your mission is not over yet. I don't know what your mission is. I know some of your mission, but I don't know what all of your mission is. Neither do you. But are you on mission with the Lord? Are you seeking what, your, what his mission for your life is? Are you pursuing it? Are you accomplishing it? Are you fulfilling your purpose? And here's the point. There's a day coming when we will all come to the end and we will stand before the Lord. And that day could be today. We may not make it home tonight. We may all make it home in heaven tonight. We don't know when the Lord's coming back for us. But we do know that time is short. And the urgency is there. The message of Daniel is not just hope for the future, but it's urgency for the present. Let's be about the mission that God has called us to be. Let's close in prayer. God, we thank you for the book of Daniel, the, the majesty of these prophecies, God, because they are from your lips, through your messengers, to Daniel, and through Daniel to us. And so, God, we take confidence and comfort in these promises we have a lot of questions remaining, God, and you don't promise to answer the, all of them, but God, we have hope in you. And we know, God, from the, all of the promises that have already been kept and all the prophecies already fulfilled that we've read about in this book, that you will keep the rest of them just as you've kept the ones you've already fulfilled. So God, we praise you for that. We thank you for that. God, may we be motivated by the urgency of the hour. We see the signs of the time. We know the time is short, God. So, God, may we about, be about your work by your spirit in your power. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you again. I'll be here for a few minutes. If anybody has a need, uh, you are dismissed. Hope to see you Wednesday night for our prayer meeting. Uh, God bless.